Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Esther Shore, the chair of the Humanities Council, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the, to, to the spring 2022 Gauss Seminars. A signature event of the Humanities Council, the Gauss Seminars are held to provide a focus for discussion, study, and the exchange of ideas in the humanities. Spanning seven decades, the seminars have featured some of the most eminent scholars in the world. Past seminar leaders have included Eric Auerbach, Hannah Arendt, W.H. Auden, Noam Chomsky, Roman Jakobson, Elaine Scarry, Joan Scott, Raymond Bellour, and more recently, Michael Hart, Wendy Brown, and Fred Moten. We are delighted to welcome faculty and grad students from Princeton University, the Institute for Advanced Study, and the community at large. Let me just take a moment to thank Andrew Cole, the director of the Gauss Seminars, for his leadership and for tending the flame during our pandemic hiatus. And now I'll turn it over to Andrew to introduce our honored guest. Thank you so much, Starry, and thank you everyone for coming out today. Um, I am the aforementioned Andrew Cole, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of English and the director of the Gauss Seminars here. It's really wonderful to get the Gauss up and running again, and this would not have been uh, possible without the help of Janine Pitaresi or Mary-Kate Connors, and I express my gratitude to them for their assistance every step of the way in organizing this event. It's been a while, uh, the hiatus, uh, which has um, uh, put the, the, the series on hold during the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic, needless to say, is still with us and still infecting, inflecting, changing, and damaging so many lives, so many bonds, in ways that must continue to be acknowledged amidst what we might call the compulsory and itself diseased or diseased optimism of our day. This is not to get off on an awkward foot so much as highlight from the first one of the many problems that this thing called reality, or better, the real, presents to us. The real as a totally disruptive and eruptive logic in the order of things requiring not only our attention, but constituting ourselves as subjects living out crises and concrete social antagonisms at every scale of being. This real, whether it's betrayed by politics, plays, films, TV shows, jokes, philosophical texts, is the central preoccupation of our esteemed guest today, Professor Alenka Zupancic. Her many books have expanded the parameters of psychoanalysis as itself a philosophy, and conversely, philosophy as motivated by questions of epistemology and ontology, what it means to be a human subject. As Zupancic puts it, quote, psychoanalysis is something that happened to philosophy and to which philosophy cannot remain indifferent, unquote. That insight truly characterizes her own world-renowned contributions to the fields of philosophy and psychoanalysis. So it's fair to say, too, that Zupancic herself is something that happened not only to philosophy and psychoanalysis, but to the humanities generally to which we cannot remain indifferent. In an earlier book like Ethics of the Real, published in the year 2000, Zupancic pushed farther than anyone the question of Kant in relation to psychoanalysis, which would seem a bold claim to make in view of Kant's essential, I'm sorry, Kant's, Lacan's essential writings on the topic and his landmark essay, Kant avec Saad, as well as his seminars 7 and 11. Even so, I'm going to claim it. Because what stands out here is that Zupancic identifies the very problematic definition of the act in Kant's famous writings on the categorical imperative. As she shows, Kant makes no structural distinction between an act that is good and an act that is evil, even though the basis of Kantian ethics in the first place is to move you toward the regulative and ethical ordering of goods by universalizing your own maxim in a manner not unlike the golden rule. But the problem for Kant is that he had no theory for the structuration of acts. And here is where Zupancic intervenes in showing that the real, that aforementioned illogic in the order of things, challenges us and structures our actions the moment the impossible happens. And that's her phrase, the moment the impossible happens. The moment when, in other words, the unimaginable, the unexpected transpires exactly at the wrong time and place, and the world seems upside down and different. 
It's at moments like these that a, quote, space for ethics, unquote, is opened up as a place for possibility. Now, the lesson I always took from her Lacanian interpretation of ethics, if I may, is that ethics, if it's worth its salt, should help us shorten the duration between emergency and response, the time between traumatic event and action, to help us as individuals and as a society act expeditiously and to be prepared to do so because we already know that the inevitable, like mass gun murders, will repeat itself again and again and again. That we fail to act at all isn't only an act in itself, as the cliche goes, but is an evil and must be called as such if we're even going to do ethics to begin with and adopt its terms. These are some of the implications of Zupentius's challenges to ethical philosophy, the way she shocks us into rethinking our values and invites us to see bigger pictures we didn't know could be portrayed. I refer to this earlier book by Zupanchich, Ethics of the Real, because it shows so clearly her abiding focus on the problem of the real throughout all her work, every bit of which must be seen as a Lacanian commitment to politics and an articulation of a political subjectivity that is constituted by the impossibilities of everyday life, the social antagonisms we encounter at every moment of our being in the world. For example, she is a great explicator of the problems of universality, or what precisely is universalizable, such as Kant attempted and failed to do. For Zupanchus, the project of thinking universally, or let's say collectively, is to think the Hegelian concrete universal as the condition of political agency. In a recent work called Sex in the Cut, for example, she writes that, quote, if we say that an emancipatory struggle has to stand up for all the oppressed and not just one particular group, that is not wrong, but it is formulated in the wrong way. We start at the wrong end. From universalism as an abstraction in relationship to particular claims that can then be included later. Instead, we should say, still quoting, whenever a particular struggle appears as embodying the divide and contradiction inherent to the universal, it functions already in itself as a principle representing everyone even if one does not belong to that particular group. Take, for example, the stupid rejoinder to the slogan, Black Lives Matter. That stupid rejoinder being, all lives matter. Yes, but the idea is that you don't get to some universal justice by repeating that it should be there for all already, but you get there by focusing on the points that embody its absence and by politically subjectivating these points in a universalist struggle. In a recent interview, Zupanchich addresses the already evident sources of her interest in universality as a topic in psychoanalysis. Quote, philosophy contributed a possibly universal scope to psychoanalytic theory. It's the impetus for this universalizing, unquote. For Zupanchich, universals matter because they rather quickly implicate ontological problems about what, where, and how being is, what processes, acts, forms, and words fall into its fissures, and how our own subjectivity spills out of these gaps in being and falls onto its butt as if to say, there's nothing here to see, I'm fine. This question of being is no better articulated than in her most recent book, What Is Sex?, in which the is in the title is in all caps as if to declare aloud the ontological problem and indeed paradoxes of sex. Hear out the keynote in Zupanchus's book, which is an anecdote from Lacan. Quote, for the moment, I am not fucking. I am talking to you. Well, I have exactly the same satisfaction as if I were fucking, unquote. That, again, was Lacan, just so you're clear. The anecdote encapsulates a problem that Zupanchich brilliantly explores in this book. It's not that in the Freudian or Freudian sense that sex is the meaning of all things, the root of all our problems, efforts, interpretations, or frustrations, and that we write, paint, exercise, walk the dog, go to talks as substitutions for the satisfaction, as substitutions for sexual gratifications gone missing, no, for Zupanchich, the problem is that sex itself, while a different activity from, say, roller skating or hiking, is equivalent to these activities in that they all involve the experience of surplus satisfaction. This insight raises to a new level, broadens, 
intellectualizes or indeed universalizes the definition of the sexual beyond sexual activity while at the same time posing the problem that sex itself is basically an activity that is singled out and oddly sexualized in our symbolic order, that sex is sexualized, where the exclusive sexualization of sex must also include censorious and censoring mechanisms that try to manage surplus sexual satisfaction and contain enjoyment. What is sex is not sex, but what is not sex is sex, but with the aforementioned provisos in mind. Ontologically speaking, then, this means that sexual being to be a subject in sex comprises what Zupanchich calls, quote, the singular points of contradiction in human reality itself, unquote, to which psychoanalysis responds. Here we have in Alenka Zupanchich a daring, brilliant, formidably funny, and superbly original thinker who works as a research advisor at the Scientific Research Center at the Slovene Academy of Sciences. She is a professor of philosophy and psychoanalysis at the European Graduate School in Zosfi, Switzerland, and a scholar of the Ljubljana School of Psychoanalysis, alongside others, most notably our mutual friends Mladen Dolar and Slavoj Žižek. It's a gift to be able to call Alenka herself a friend, too, and I ask you to please help me welcome her to the Gauss Seminars. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, for this really, really warm, welcoming speech. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for coming here, and of course also everyone involved in organizing this uh, event. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm honored to be here, and it's for me as well the first kind of public lecture after the, the COVID hit us, uh, apart from some Zoom things and some smaller things. So it is a kind of, I feel I have kind of a newly reacquired stage fright to, <laughs> to be, to speak from the stage again after, uh, after a while. So I will simply get to the point, to the dead ends that I'm supposed to talk about today. Uh, so the end, uh, this, uh, I've been working actually on this question of the end uh, for a while, and I must say that the general focus of my research shifted quite significantly at some point. Uh, at first, uh, my research was mostly preoccupied with the possibility or impossibility to end something. Uh, and this was grounded in turn in what was generally perceived in progressive politics, in philosophy, in critical theory, as a desire for change, a kind of necessity of change, combined uh, with a frustrating impossibility to really change anything. In terms of the end, this translates as, on the one hand, the will or the desire for something to end, on, and on the other hand, the impossibility for this to happen. So of course, in the simplest and most general terms, what we felt needed to change or end was, for instance, the neoliberal capitalist world order that kept producing harsher and harsher antagonisms, which in turn fueled uh, various deplorable forms of populism. At the same time, we were also forced to keep pointing out how this world order was able to cash in, cash in and absorb even the most radical and subversive ideas and to permanently <coughs> revolutionize itself through its own crises and critical points, as was already pointed out by Marx. So this is a configuration in which the end appeared at the same time uh, as necessary and impossible. But then I believe uh, that reality has changed. Perhaps at some point around 2008 or a little bit later, it's, something has changed. And uh, the end in several of its aspects no longer looks impossible. Okay, many even talk about the end of capitalism, not as a good news, uh, but end of capitalism as we knew it. You know, uh, Mackenzie Work wrote this book, Capital is Dead. Um, end of capitalism and it's changing into something like techno-feudalism or neo-feudalism, as Jody Dean calls it. Uh, so uh, this would be one thing that 
has changed. Not that we are over with it, but something dramatic is uh, happening, is changing there. COVID crisis obviously has brought to the fore and horrific, uh, horrifically amplified many of the latent social and economic antagonisms, social differences, and so on. Uh, the climate change is starting to dramatically reshape our living conditions as well as shaking the foundations, the very uh, foundations of our economies. In other words, to talk about the need to change, the need for change, I think has very much become meaningless. So no wonder that it has been uh, taken over by those in power mostly, where it basically means adapting to the new reality of something even worse than capitalism. It means something like we need to change our ways of being in order to accommodate this supposedly natural and disastrous, sometimes very disastrous, tectonic shifts. So I claim a change, a major tectonic change, is already happened, happening whether we like it or not. It did not wait for us to decide that we now really wanted to put an end to what was going on and say, like in Monty Python's, that's it, and now for something completely different. So, I think we know enough about these changes. I won't go into details, so we will see some of them later perhaps, but we know enough about these changes to have every reason to freak out, genuinely freak out, and yet we don't. At least most of us don't. And I believe that the Freudian concept of the disavowal, Verleugnung, is a concept that kind of perfectly describes what seems to be the prevailing attitude today when it comes to various disasters and catastrophic futures that become part of our reality as, it, as if it were nothing. So this does not mean, we, if we talk about the disavowal, this does not mean that we simply fail to acknowledge these changes, these ends, these shifts and do not talk about them. That is not what this world is about. On the contrary, we do talk about them uh, a lot, um, and we fully acknowledge them. So what goes on could rather be formulated uh, with the following pun, provided precisely that we don't take it as a pun, but most literally. The world is ending, but hey, it's not the end of the world. So there is something radical and traumatic about these changes, uh, these ends and kind of cataclysmic futures that should wake us up, yet it doesn't seem to do so. Or perhaps more accurately, we wake up so as to go on dreaming, to use Lacan's words about nightmares, that is dreams in which a real appears that is more real and traumatic than our everyday reality. So we do wake up and proclaim to be, to be wild awake in order to continue to dream, untouched precisely by the real that has just appeared. Waking up in this way functions in a strange complicity with disavowal. Of course, disavowal is not the only modality of avoiding circumventing some deeply traumatic, unpleasant real. There is also denial, verneinung, and there is déjà vu. You know, when you say, okay, but there is nothing really new about all this. We have seen this many times before. Another phrase that I think comes up very often these days, and I will address it a little bit uh, later. But I will focus primarily on disavowal in both its, in its classical and contemporary forms. Actually, I will try to uh, argue what would be, what are the contemporary forms of disavowal which are slightly different from its, let's say, classical form. Uh, so let me take as my starting point uh, this seminal text on what Freud termed disavowal, namely Octave Manouni's paper, I know well, but all the same. I'm sure most of you know this paper. Um, the, the title is already captures perfectly what the disavowal is all about. 
Uh, I know something is the case, but I keep behaving, acting as if I didn't know what I know and what I'm able to state clearly as my knowledge. So Manunis is a remarkable text. He presents several examples through which he lays out uh, a variety of slightly different forms of disavowal, uh, with the so-called fetishist disavowal being uh, its most achieved form, so to say. Uh, why? Because it transfers, this fetishist disavowal, it transfers the disavowed belief, that is to say that the, but all the same part of this formula, I know well, but all the same, it transfers this to an object, to an object existing outside to a fetish, liberating the subject of all forms of unconscious belief. For disavowal, Verleugnung is not repression, it's not the same as Verdringung. This means that it is not that I unconsciously keep believing what I know to be otherwise. I don't need to do this for the fetish beliefs in my stead. So whereas the phrase I know well but all the same is the trademark or the signature of disavowal, fetishists will never simply say, will never say but all the same. Since his but all the same is his fetish. This is the, the, the whole point. Or for someone perhaps more neurotic, uh, their but all the same is the way they behave materially in their lives, keep behaving. Um, so the most famous example Manuni discusses does not involve a fetish, however, but nevertheless exposes perfectly the constitution of this kind of magical belief that is at the core of all disavowal. It's an example from the autobiography of Hopi Indian Don Talayeswa, son chief, in which Talayeswa offers an account that duly describes the formation of the magical belief that supports, supports disavowal. In this particular case, this belief is the belief in the katsinas, spirits or gods. At a certain season of the year, the katsinas appear in the Pueblos, much as Santa Claus appears in our culture. And again, like Santa, they take strong interest in children. They also resemble uh, Santa Claus in that they conspire with parents to deceive the children. But differently from Santa, they are more terrifying figures. So the imposture is very, very strictly maintained. A lot of social effort goes into it, and no one would dare to expose it. So Talayeswa presents us with the account describing how, when presented with the fact that the masked dancers dancing in the Pueblos, the children were told were katsinas, are in truth their fathers and uncles masked as Katsinas, how at that point he, Talayeswa, started to believe in the magical presence of the Katsinas. In the first step, there is what can be justly described as a traumatizing blow. When the Katsinas entered the Kiva without masks, Talayeswa writes, I had a great surprise. There were not spirits. I recognized all of them and I felt very unhappy because I had been told that all my life that Katsinas were gods. I was especially shocked and angry when I saw that all my clan fathers and uncles were dancing as Katsinas. I felt the worst when I saw my own father. So this is the first step. Then the second step is that of a disavowal proper based on the following explanation by the adults. Now you know, the children are told, that the real Katsinas do not come to dance in the Pueblos the way they did in the old days. Now they only come invisibly and on the days of the dance, they dwell in their masks in mystical fashion. So at that point, a belief is formed in the mystical presence of the Katsinas, for Thales, at least, that is in the real existence, in the real existence of the spirits, even though the children now know very well that 
what the, the dancing figures they saw were not katsinas and that they never actually saw a katsina. So this belief is then further facilitated and consolidated, obviously, by the existing social institutions. But it emerges, as you can see, at the same time as the knowledge of how the things really stand. So this complicates the usual kind of linear scheme, schema in an interesting way. It is not simply that we have first some traumatic experience which these beliefs in spirits and so on and institutions supporting them then help us deal with or disavow. Were the children not intentionally deceived into believing in the reality of the katsinas, they would be spared the traumatic, disappointing revelation that the katsinas are in truth their fathers and uncles. In other words, socially traumatic experiences are often intentionally induced so that the belief and institution would be able to function. This is what initiation is usually all about, a ritual never without a traumatic dimension, yet meant to reinforce the institution that enforces it. Moreover, as Manuni also convincingly shows, it would be wrong to assume that belief is a first, a kind of childish stage, say, of human attitude to the world, which gets later replaced by enlightened knowledge. And since this knowledge is sometimes unpleasant or traumatic, we regress back to the belief or continue to believe what we have believed before the blow of knowledge came. It would be wrong to say that prior to their initiation, the Hopi children just naively believed in the Katsina spirit. No, they were objectively deceived. They didn't know any better. The phrase is very appropriate here, I think. They didn't know any better. It is not that their credulity, in their credulity, they believed some crazy, incredible story. The story was presented to them by the adults, by the authorities, as credible as the objective truth. A lot of effort, again, went into this. So, and this is interesting, the knowledge into which they are initiated, namely that the dancing katsinas are really their fathers and uncles, becomes the very ground of the belief in the strict sense of the word, belief in the mystical presence of the spirits dwelling in masks, belief in something that cannot be seen directly. This belief only starts with that knowledge, the, the, the knowledge and belief they uh, uh, emerge at the same time. Again, what is crucial here is not simply that the belief in the mystical powers of the spirits enables the Hopis to deal with the blow inflicted by the revelation that the dancing spirits are in fact their relatives. Belief as form of disavowal demands this revelation. It demands the blow, the knowledge and its accompanying trauma as its internal condition. And this is very important precisely because uh, it is what makes this belief unassailable, resistant to knowledge. Knowledge cannot be a remedy for disavowal. Since, I quote Manuni, since the sole reason for but all the same is the I know well. So this is this kind of interesting intrinsic knot at the very heart of disavowal, when you cannot say that uh, uh, there is uh, that the knowledge is somehow replaced by this uh, archaic or stupid belief or something like this. Um, no, it, we could even say that knowledge precedes this belief. So this was a very brief presentation of Manunis, one part of Manunis' paper, which is very long and rich. But I would now like to introduce an emphasis that is slightly different from Manunis. Namely, Manuni associates the traumatism at the origin of disavowal, in this particular case, with the blow it deals to the children's belief in the katsinas, in these creatures. Uh, something that they thought was there and real does not, in fact, exist. This is what says, as says Manuni, which is traumatic. An object that they took to be an object of the world is not really there. 
I'm tempted to put an emphasis on another albeit related aspect of this. For what is being relieved to the children is not only that the dancing katsinas are in fact just dancing fathers and uncles dressed up as katsinas, but also that these fathers and uncles, with the full complicity of the mothers, were deliberately deceiving them. The disillusionment, the blow dealt here, has two sides, or two arrows, we could say. One sets a limit to the powers of the other, the big other, the adults, fathers, gods, spirits, mothers, uncles, and consequently, and by means of the initiation through which children themselves become this other, transition to its position, it also sets a limit to their, to our subjective, let's say, ego-related powers. Very, very roughly, we could call this dimension a kind of symbolic castration. No? The big other is not completely full. The other arrow of this blow shatters and then reinstalls or not the trust in others, in social authorities, in knowledge in general. For what can one believe? And who can one trust if authority is deception? Again, things are very interesting here. Freud and Lacan maintain that there is no original drive for knowledge. You know. However, in view of these considerations, we could also say that a drive or desire for knowledge, while not being original, can step in at a certain moment precisely as the consequence of the discussed blow or disillusionment related to deception. Um, paradoxically, or perhaps not so paradoxically, the desire for knowledge as well as science can function as a modality of the defense against other traumatizing dimension of knowledge related to the deception, to, to, to this uh, symbolic castration. Yet a defense that does not take path of disavowal. And let us not forget, which is quite significant in this context, that the philosopher associated most directly with the, with the advent of modern science, namely Descartes, starts his founding work, Meditation on First Philosophy, with the assumption of an almighty deceiver, an evil genius, another constantly deceiving us about everything. This is crucial point, as you know, of the so-called methodological doubt. Uh, so that even things that seem more obvious can be a result of this big other deceiving me. He says, for instance, he writes Descartes, but every time that this preconceived opinion of the sovereign power of a god presents itself to my thought, I'm constrained to confess that it is easy to him if he wishes to cause me to err, even in matters in which I believe myself to have the best evidence. So you, you see here, modern science and the notion of a possibly deceiving other of authority coincide somehow in this figure, uh, which is far from insignificant. In this presupposition, in this experience, what sweeps the ground for the scientific method and for searching for the kind of knowledge that would break away from the reliance on authority uh, is, is precisely this. Although, of course, Descartes himself quickly reinstalls this authority. Um, so let us, and this is all building up to something, if you trust me. So let us look a bit closely to what happens uh, in the cart here, at this point of the short circuit between doubt, proceeding from the doubt resulting from the possibility of being systematically deceived by uh, the other, the authority, uh, the short circuit between doubt and certainty as the ground of, possibly ground of scientific knowledge. Doubt has several sides and several ways in which it can function as the source of certainty. I will sketch out very briefly four that I think psychoanalysis can help us put 
in perspective and it constitute an interesting matrix like a square uh, that will then help me situate some of the contemporary social phenomena in respect to, to this question. So first version of this combination of this uh, um, configuration of doubt and certainty, I would call it split of knowledge and being, or perhaps constitution of the unconscious, or certainty of being. As you know, at the heart of the Cartesian proceeding is the point in which the methodic doubt in what I know produces certainty of being. I can doubt everything that I know, and I do doubt everything that I know, and here the certainty of what I know disappears, and something else appears. It flips into a certainty of being. Therefore, I am. Even if everything that I know is false, I'm still the subject of this false knowledge. I have these false thoughts, therefore I am. However, one can legitimately question the continuity that is allegedly at stake in this proceeding, uh, the continu uh, continuity situated by Descartes in knowledge. After the knowledge about things, about ourselves, is put into doubt, we end with one only certain knowledge that remains, that of our being. But is this really knowledge? Is this certainty knowledge? Are certainty and knowledge about certainty one and the same thing? Is certainty the last and only knowledge that remains? Or are we rather dealing here with a discontinuity and the shift. One could indeed argue, I believe, that Cartesian methodic doubt produces not simply certainty of being, but above all, a split between knowledge and being. One either is or one knows. There is no direct continuity here. When I know that I am, I'm no longer really with the certainty of being. I'm already, so to say, in its after effect. Moreover, and to push this a bit further in perhaps a bit crazy way, but I think this has some uh, ground, we could legitimately ask, is the cogito ergo sum, ergo sum, the ultimate proof of our being, or is it rather something like an escape into being at the moment of radical doubt? Uh, Descartes stages the argument so that it points to the pre-existence of a substance or being that has all these thoughts, even if they are false. But what if this substance or pure being or being qua being is a result, a projectile of the substance of doubt? What if being becomes being only in the gesture of kind of ejecting itself out of the hyperbolic doubt splitting with all content of knowledge. And a follow-up question, would this make the cogito an escape from madness, as some argued, or rather the inaugural point of madness in the sense of structurally inaugural point of the unconscious? You know, it is precisely the knowledge that, we, that falls out when we are. And I would say that this last point is precisely how, how Lacan reads it, uh, which I think is rather palpable in his seminar of 14. I don't, I'm not sure if it has been published yet uh, or translated in English. Uh, uh, it's a seminar called La Logique du Fantasme, uh, where he renders the cogito in the following way. I am where I don't think. I think where I am not. So I think this renders perfectly precisely this schism, this kind of a, a alternative that pops up here. It's not simply a continuity. There is something that disappears here. And the, the I that keeps emerging, I am where I don't think, I think where I am not, the I that keep, keeps re-emerging in this sequence is precisely the subject uh, of the unconscious, this pure shifter, the subject split between being and knowledge. 
This I is the only and fleeting, disappearing and reappearing link between being and knowledge. But it has no, no substance. OK, this would be a first version or with a kind of critical perspective on it of this uh, escape to being as the, the, the result of this configuration of doubt, the so certainty of being. So the other possibility would be restored trust or belief in the other. So again, to start with Descartes, after establishing the only point of certainty, situated in the sole point of enunciation. Descartes sets out, as you know, to reconquer the world and to reestablish the general validity of scientific knowledge. For this, he needs no less than to establish the existence of a good at omniscient God, uh, based on the so-called ontological proof of the existence of God. So we may know certainly uh, we may know with certainty that we think, but nothing guarantees the certainty or the truth uh, of the content of our thoughts. In order to institute a science about the external world and about us as part of this external world, it is necessary to assume the existence of a God who is incapable of deception, who created eternal truths, and as Descartes puts it, planted them in our souls as seeds. Thus, man, woman, whatever, is the subject of knowledge and can play the possessor of the world only insofar as he is depository of the truths of another. You know that this philosophical debate continued then with the empiricists questioning this Cartesian move in many ways, culminated with Hume's demonstrating the invalidity of the very notion of causality which then woke Kant from his dogmatic slumber and led to the proposition of the transcendental. You know the story. And it continues today with various forms of realism, critical, and so on. So I'm not going into this. I simply want to point out how there is a problem here, a persisting gap that persists, yeah, that insists. And the move towards restoring the trust of the other and in the knowledge after this possibly, let's say, traumatic experience of radical doubt, of deception, um, in the, the case of Descartes, is precisely the, the move that uh, can kind of, uh, that involves this gap. The gap does not disappear, and all the critical comments are pointing this out. Uh, but this move toward uh, the restoring of trust also has obviously a social history outside the domains of philosophy and theology. And the Hoppe example is a good illustration of the social functioning which, although it could be related to religion, um, is not intrinsically religious but concerns a much more general uh, or also much more specific form of belief as uh, uh, belief as something that uh, is very fundamental to any social tissue. You know, as uh, I think John Locke said, you know, he that will not move before he has the proof that it will, um, uh, what he go, wants to do will succeed, he will just sit there and die and he will not even eat and so on. I mean, there, there were arguments showing how we need this kind of leap of trust on the basic level of survival, not only to, to do some kind of high metaphysics, but actually if we need to know for sure what we are doing before we do it, we will probably just uh, sit there and perish. So um, I will return this in a moment where I'll try to develop how this issue socially um, relates to contemporary forms of disavowal. Uh, but let me now move very briefly to the next possible configuration of doubt and certainty, which I propose to call certainty about the existence of the deceiving other. So we had first instance of uh, uh, certainty of my being. Now there is then we had certainty about the good, non-deceiving other restoration of trust. But there is also a third possibility, which is certainty about the existence of the deceiving other. Obviously, this position differs from the Cartesian position. It is the escape not to our being, 
but precisely to the being of the big other, or the other supposed to know, but at the price of the other being evil and deceiving, yet consistently so. You see here, we don't even come to the question of possibly restoring the trust in the other. The move from uncertainty and deception to the certainty of the existence of the other is kind of immediate. In this position, I can be certain of nothing except that the other is deceiving me or is out to deceive me. And we can add that as the object of this deception, I therefore exist. So the other is deceiving me, therefore I must exist. Uh, or if we relate this to the Katsina's example, we could say the blow related to the limitation of the other and consequently of myself, the revelation that the other maintains its authority by a handful of tricks and deceptions gets transfigured into the other's omnipotence in deceiving. The omnipotence and the consistency of the other is preserved as long as we can believe that it is constantly and consistently deceiving us. Uh, so you see, we, we seem to be dealing with a desperate attempt almost to preserve the agency of the big other unscattered, untacked, yet an attempt that can succeed only at the price of moving the big other to the zone of malevolence and evil. The consistency of big other can no longer manifest itself in anything else but in other successfully deceiving us. The big other can only be the big fraud or the big deceiver. Yet, as such, it exists, and it has unlimited powers. Uh, I think you can recognize here certain features of paranoia, perhaps, as well as of the functioning of conspiracy theories, which invest most of their time precisely in finding or manufacturing proofs that the other is deceiving us all the time, and that it is omnipotent in this. The deceitfulness and malevolence seem to vouch from within for the consistency of the big other. And the consistency, again, that remains utterly untouched in the midst of all the allegedly radical critique and skepticism at work in, for instance, conspiracy theories. The other is almighty and, or in other terms, we could say, no, castrated. So this figure has to be there, untouched. Okay, now I'm moving to the fourth position, which I would call anxiety or as certainty of our non-existence. I mean, anxiety is yet another form of certainty, at least according to Lacan, and I think he, he has something very, uh, uh, he said something very interesting here. Anxiety is something like a full frontal certainty, to paraphrase Monty Python's full frontal nudity again. As Lacan insists, anxiety is not a reaction or defense against unpleasant certainty. It is a form of certainty. It is a signal of the real. It is as close as we can come to it. As such, precisely, it has a significant value in psychoanalysis. It is not simply something to get rid of as soon as possible. Instead, one needs to administer it in the right dosages, work with it. Anxiety is as close as we come to the real of the trauma without repression or disavowal, precisely. It is certainly unbearable, close to unbearable, but still it is connected to something quite real. So the certainty at stake here is, I would say, the opposite of the certainty of being. I, it could rather be rendered like follows. I know, for instance, about the inconsistency of the other, the deception, therefore I am not. It is a certainty about non-being, we could say. So here, the lack appears, so to say, in, persons, overwhel in person, overwhelmingly. It appears as an object, almost, that is there. And the result is, as the famous phrase from Lacan goes, that the lack starts lacking. Monk vient à manquer. And kind of pushes me out of being, making me return as the very 
lack of being and the real of this configuration. Okay, so there is certain, certainly a lot of, an anxi of anxiety around today, but unlike psych in psychoanalysis, it is being socially depreciated as a signal of the real, which is to say heavily medicated and deliberately replaced by a kind of contemporary postmodern forms of disavowal for which institutions or institutions and ideologies provide convenient and ample foundation. In moments of serious crisis, we are not allowed to despair, let alone unite with others in despair. We are expected to quickly get better. And this seemingly benevolent care for our well-being has a price, or many different prizes. And one is precisely a maintenance, maintenance of the status quo. And let me stress uh, that the latter, the status quo, does not simply mean that things remain the same, or only that they remain the same, but also that, that it could mean that what is changing drastically for the worse doesn't really get to us. Adapting to the new reality is part of the status quo, precisely. And so are different sorts of catastrophisms and apocalypticisms. So, okay, let me finally come to this central question. What is the most widely spread form of disavowal today? I would describe it as a further twist in relation to the classical form of fetishist disavowal in which knowledge about some traumatic reality in this new form, the knowledge about some traumatic reality gets kind of strangely redoubled, redoubled and starts playing the role of the very object that protects me against this reality. In other words, knowledge adopts a new and different role. It is no longer simply something to be disavowed, but paradoxically, something that can help us, help me disavow the real of this same knowledge. I will explain this further, but just think of how important it is today not to be naive, to not be deceived or duped, to know how things really stand, to know what is behind, to know that the other is full of tricks and unreliable, uh, if not purposely and constantly deceiving, and above all, to let others know that we know very well. I'm not saying that there are not reasons for this mistrust, but there is this impulse to, to say, to speak out loud, to tell everyone that we know very well that this is the case. And we are much more concerned with deception than with the real, what goes around about us. So the question, I think, in this new configuration is no longer like it is in relation to the classical disavowal why does this knowledge, why do the revelations like the emperor is naked not really work? Why don't really work? So that we continue to believe and behave otherwise. The question is rather how do these kinds of revelations and knowledge themselves actively contribute to sustaining the very illusion they allegedly disrupt? Put more generally, it is as if a precipitated recognition and knowledge about some problem, which we, know, which we now allegedly know all about, actually helped us disregard this very problem as problem. So what exactly is the further twist that appears in relation to the classical mode of fetishist disavowal? I know very well that there is no X, but I keep believing and behaving uh, that there is, as if there were. Uh, what is this modern form in which the belief, uh, the, uh, in relation to this classical form in which the belief is outsourced to the fetish? In order to formulate it perhaps more palpably, I will now briefly introduce yet another structure discussed by Freud, which I think we should read together with that of fetishist disavowal. Namely, in one of his short but brilliant pieces, Freud discusses the phenomenon of so-called false reconnaissance, or false memory, the déjà vu. And he starts by pointing out how 
If not, infre uh, it not, this is a quote, it not infrequently happens in the course of an analytic treatment uh, that the patient, after reporting some fact that he has remembered, will go on to say, oh, but I've told you that already, while the analyst himself feels sure that this is the first time he has heard the story. So very briefly, what is the logic at stake in the phenomenon of false memory? This is how I think we could put it to make it as clear as possible. Something that has just arisen and is of traumatic, disruptive nature is intercepted and derealized by a precipitated knowledge or recognition of it. We look at it as belonging to some other time and, or temporality. We are looking straight at the traumatic thing. It is right there in front of our eyes, fully acknowledged. Yet we see it as something already in the past coming from far away as strange and indifferent. So the false reconnaissance uh, paradoxically maintains this kind of unfamiliar or indifferent character of what appeared by means of the very feeling of recognition and familiarity. We know all about it, this is already. Uh, so we could also say that it maintains it by means of cutting the thing from its possible articulation as presence in reality. For this articulation appears already the first time as its own memory. So if we now relate this to the structure of the fetishist disavowal, we could perhaps formulate the further twist uh, that can and does appear in the letter. So if in the classical structure of fetishist disavowal, the fetish takes upon itself the material existence, the existence in the reality of our disavowed belief, what happens with this new structure is I think that knowledge itself starts to function as fetish, as this object. The precipitated knowledge about how things really stand, the knowledge that we rush to flag up, makes it possible for us precisely to ignore what we know, the real of what we know, and even to actively support what we know to be wrong. Um, so, but of course, the fetishization of knowledge is not to be taken here uh, uh, in this kind of metaphorical sense, but really in the clinical sense. Uh, what is at stake is not that knowledge is extremely valued, uh, overemphasized, and in this sense fetishized. Uh, what is at stake is that in a kind of folding over itself, knowledge takes the structural place of the fetish that helps us ignore some traumatic reality. All that is important is that we can declare to know all about it and that we are nobody dupes and that we let others know about it. In the COVID crisis, we were able to see this particularly in the explosion of theories explaining, proclaiming the knowledge about how and why the pandemic started. It was the Chinese, the pharmaceutical industry, capitalism that needed it to print more money and enhance financial speculation, reinforce biopolitical tools and surveillance, and so on. And I'm not saying that some of these theories don't have a possibly rational core, or that the pandemic didn't, in fact, come very handy for all kinds of purposes, including surveillance, biopolitics, and restructuring of the capital. What remains irrational, however, is the way in which the advocates of these theories often seem or seem to believe that it is enough to expose, to know all about the reasons and possibly the machinations behind the COVID crisis in order for the real of the pandemic itself to simply disappear, to dissipate, to become unreal. So so what if the Chinese planted the virus? Does it, take it, does it make it any less dangerous or real? I mean, or any other of these theories. Do people stop dying? It is fascinating how easy these kind of uh, considerations of theories make it to ignore, indeed to disavow, 
the real of the crisis, the deaths and other complications, the individual and social trauma of it. Even if it were true that somebody wanted this and made it happen, the it is still here, all around us. And the solution is certainly not to act as if it weren't. And I think we can detect something similar in the popular statement, which is, I guess, very general across the globe, that all politicians and all politics are corrupt. Even if this were indeed so, it doesn't change anything to the real of the corruption, but rather kind of gives it a cover. We are satisfied with knowing all about it. This is kind of satisfaction. We know that they're all corrupt. Uh, it's a kind of surplus knowledge that is important here. Now, in conclusion, let me try to answer this question. How can this permutation happen? How can knowledge start to function like an object protecting us from knowledge? I believe the answer is to be sought in the structural function precisely in place of the fetish, which already carries in itself, if you think about it, a moment of redoubling, particularly in perversion. In it, a fetish is not only, is, uh, not only allows us to ignore the reality, some reality for Freud, it's the reality of castration, but to actually, uh, actively sorry, enjoy the tool of this ignoring, the fetish. So, um, and as Freud, Freud, uh, as Freud pointed out, not only do fetishists not experience the fetish uh, as the symptom or of an ailment accompanied by suffering, usually they, quite, they are quite satisfied with it, uh, says Freud, or even prize the way in which it enhances their erotic life. So there is no um, difficulty here. People don't come to analysis complaining about this terrible thing in their lives, which is the fetish. Uh, on the contrary. And Easy is their erotic life seems to be a mild term here, enhances would seem to be, should come closer to the mark. So this is, there is clearly a dimension of surplus satisfaction here. In other words, <coughs> what is at stake in fetishist perversion in the clinical sense is never just disavowal, but what we could call the enjoyment of the disavowal. That is to say, the disavowal itself as a possible source of enjoyment. And this is different from the classical structure of disavowal, uh, which is like more neurotic structure, which is basically about kind of shielding us from some unpleasant reality. Although, of course, the classical disavowal can help us get access to various forms of social enjoyment, as in the Hoppy case example, this is not the same thing as enjoying the disavowal itself, the, the, the very disavowal, the object incarnating this belief. And I would add the different modalities of uh, catastrophism and uh, apocalypticism, often related to the mystical and the occult, are also good examples of this enjoying the disavowal itself, uh, the very uh, vocabulary of it, the, uh, of the catastrophe, of, the, of what we know about this uh, whatever cate uh, cate uh, catastrophe. So, what happens to the disavowed belief in this case? What happens to but all the same? Where is it exactly? I said earlier that it is there in the fetish, that the fetish believes in our stead, while we can maintain a fully rational position. We don't claim that this is so. But how, in what, in what way is the belief there in the fetish? Uh, precisely in the element of enjoyment. Enjoyment takes on, I think, the, the office of belief. The pervert fetishist maintains his belief through enjoyment. He, she, whatever, can continue to believe as long as he can enjoy and provoke the enjoyment in the other. I won't go into different versions of uh, this clinical structure of perversion. The enjoyment testifies to the fact that what is not there or no longer there is somehow still there 
at least for the subject. I don't need to believe because uh, I have a proof. So fetishism of knowledge means not that knowledge is over-validated, but that we can find enjoyment in flagging our knowledge, rushing to assert it, with this enjoyment magically protecting us against the reality of what we know. And as we can observe, it so happens that this enjoyment can be ultimately more precious to us than anything else, including our life. For the latter is frequently at stake in the crises and disasters that, that befall us. And apropos of which, we often hear that contemporary biopolitics reduces us to a bare life, that is, that it enslaves us uh, by making us hostages to the mere survival. Uh, that nothing else matters, basically, we are reduced to this animal survival, whatever. And I'm not sure at all that this is what is at stake. There is little evidence around that we really care about our survival. We rather seem to be caught in a profoundly self-destructive carnival. Lives don't really matter except rhetorically, or only some lives, perhaps. So I would rather say that it is um, this same biopolitics and its ideological climate that accounts for the kind of crazy heroism that I um, mentioned before, and which is predicated on the disavowal, precisely. We'd rather die than let ourselves be scared to death by what we are facing, and thus really do something about it, or whatever, rebel, try to organize in a different, substantially different way. And this is because contemporary biopolitics is primarily the politics of enjoyment and not of bare life. It is only interested in life as the source of some kind of surplus enjoyment. And if we keep in mind this recruitment of enjoyment or this coalescence of knowledge, this empty knowledge and enjoyment, then this strange heroism that I mentioned is not so surprising. Enjoyment was conceptualized by psychoanalysis precisely as something that exists or persists beyond the pleasure principle and beyond the immediate interests of survival. Which is why disavowal, let's say, of real danger, disavowal of it, predicted precisely upon the perverse enjoyment of the disavowal, can be literally lethal. We know that we have already embarked on the train to disaster. And to think what is or may be ahead of us is truly scary and should scare the shit out of us. Yet, as a general rule, this does not happen. It does not wake us up and make us decide to jump off that train, even if this kills us. Which would be the true courage in this case, okay, without being the oppos in opposition to survival? We should jump off even if perhaps this kills it, but try something else. Instead, and through the bias of an instantly found satisfaction offered by the enjoyment in flagging our knowledge about all this, we find the W's courage to stay on that train even if this kills us, since we are certainly going to die if we remain on that train. Uh, I think this is indeed one of the occasions in which enjoyment, kind of losing its radically negative edge and coming, in fact, close to the pleasure principle, works in a powerful alliance with destruction and death, which was discussed in Freud's uh, Discontent in Civilization and what Freud called the, the dead drive, and which we Lacanians kind of tried to distinguish a little bit from that. But I think this combination is indeed what is at stake. So I will conclude here. Am I saying that we are somehow and massively becoming perverse, like subjectively cho choosing uh, perversion as our position? No. First, because of obviously we can also simply feel lost and disorientated but mostly because I believe that the, this perverse disavowal is not simply something coming from the depths of our soul, uh, but is strongly 
socially, economically encouraged. Everything pushes us in that direction. It is not simply a spontaneous subjective uh, defense against harsh reality and disappointment. Rather, it is a remedy that the social order offers us against the ills that it itself produces out of the depths of its antagonisms. It is the social order that is perverse. Okay, thank you very much. This is Yes, of course. Sorry. So we have some time for some questions, which I know that the uh, manager would be happy to. Yeah, I hope this made some sense. I mean, it was uh, kind of taken from a um, larger argument, so I tried to make it so that it would still follow a certain line. But perhaps there were some, some blanks in it that I can uh, try to cover in the discussion if you have questions. Jeff, thank you. I was just wondering how knowledge that works this way, fetish knowledge, gets made. I'm thinking that Freud has an account of how dreams get made out of placement. Are, are there dynamics that take um, what, what becomes useful to us as fetish knowledge out of the real? Yeah, I, I think uh, there certainly is a kind is a kind of dynamics and logic in it. Uh, which is combined, as I try to, to, uh, to say at the end, uh, with the kind of a social encouragement or favorization of certain forms of, uh, of the form, certain forms of knowledge, uh, because in a way, um, perhaps we could go back to this uh, starting point when I was discussing uh, the, the several dimensions of knowledge, the knowledge uh, that kind of can be split in whatever its content, whatever it is saying, describing, and the possibly, let's say, traumatic dimension of it, that it also can give us a certain blow. And by the way, you remember how there is this famous uh, quote from Freud when he talks in the, the Copernicus, uh, Darwin, uh, Copernicus Darwin Freud, uh, he talks about blows that the science, so that, that there is this kind of uh, traumatic dimension that occur, occurs together with the advance of knowledge, which is not necessarily, I mean, which could be kind of a, abstracted from or taken away from the content of this knowledge. The, the fact that, the, that we lost our, space, uh, our place at the center of the world is traumatic, has nothing to do intrinsically with the content of this knowledge. So uh, I think there is an interesting dialectic that already starts there. And we could say that um, psychoanalysis uh, deals precisely with these other kinds of knowledge, which are Traumatic knowledge is not simply the content of this or that, but precisely the, cont the knowledge that gets repressed at the very time when the content of this knowledge is generally accepted or is becoming a kind of a general yeah, rule of what we know, the state of the art the, uh, of our knowledge. Uh, so in this sense, we could also say that uh, uh, Copernic, Darwin, Freud, OK, but they are not exactly the same. I mean, the, the, what Freud does is precisely put an accent on this thing that kind of goes on or is repressed uh, or constitutes the other side, the, the possibly affective other side of, the, uh, of this knowledge itself, which is precisely never or not never, but very often we cannot simply separate the two. So the knowledge itself could have this kind of very effective underside. So there is this kind of dialectics that already starts there. And uh, I would say in answer to your question that uh, there is a way in which, uh, particularly in our societies, uh, this kind of um, 
empty knowledge, emptied precisely of this kind of uh, uh, really traumatic thing. We, we talk a lot about trauma and suffering and so on, but I think it's always as if these were two separate things. So, the, But to know something uh, functions as we, we talk about knowledge or we talk about effect. Uh, and I think, and as you know, perhaps uh, Lacan was often um, reproached for not um, emphasize, or overemphasizing the kind of uh, intellectual side and uh, not, uh, uh, not, uh, not emphasizing enough the affective part. But for him, the whole point was precisely that you cannot separate the two. That if you just, that he was talking about both all the time. So it's, so I guess this is a, uh, this would be a way to say how uh, there is a certain way in which uh, this kind of social validation or even um, need that we feel to be on the right side, let's say, uh, of the history of the social processes by at least being able to say, okay, but to say, okay, but uh, we know these things. I mean, we can complain that uh, there are mysterious things going behind and we don't know about them, but still we know that they're going behind. So that there is this dialectics uh, of knowledge functioning in in very interesting uh, ways that goes on, I guess, and has its own yeah, logic and, and dynamics, which is not unrelated to the dynamics of the of the unconscious. But uh, yeah, something. Let me bring the microphone around so that your question can be recorded for the. Oh, Joan Scott. Let me go to Joan Scott first. Doesn't matter. So. Could you explain a little more about the comment you made about biopolitics now being about the about enjoyment rather than bare life? That seemed to me to, to come really quickly, and I just need yeah, to yeah. understand that better. You know, uh, yeah, I, 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 as I said, and I really apologize, I did cut this paper from a much more uh, longer work in progress, uh, but uh, the, the, I, ma I mentioned it just like in, in parentheses, actually, uh, because it uh, occurred to me that this could be another way of um, um, arguing, and I, 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 don't, I don't think I'm the first one to argue this, uh, that biopolitics is actually a politics of surplus enjoyment, that there is the, the interest, uh, that, that what what the interest in bare life is, is not simply the direct interest in bare life, but in what this bare life can produce precisely as its surplus. So there is this kind of combination, okay, there is biopolitics, there is also a kind of uh, Badiouian argument by Alain Badiou, which is not, which doesn't come from the same direction as this biopolitical, uh, argument which says that in contemporary whatever capitalism or even democracy that we are reduced to that only life matters, that we are reduced to the mere survival as the most important thing that can, um, this kind of blackmail that, uh, okay, if you are dead, then you cannot do anything. But so for him, there is this kind of a, what matters is precisely what is, what is there in life more than life. But at the same time, I think also that there is something here which where I would not simply go in, in this uh, uh, but you in direction because I think what we are witnessing is precisely some kind of strange, bizarre, crazy heroism, as I call it. So it's not that we care so much about this. I really think that this is a very, if you just look around, no, I mean, we are fed with this idea that, yeah, you, uh, life is the, the, the basic thing that you need to, to have in order to do whatever, but generally speaking, we behave as we didn't really care so much about the, the survival of uh, the individual or on the collective scale, uh, and perhaps even much more on the collective scale. So uh, this kind of kept me or induced me to ask this question whether uh, this is precisely the, the wrong position or that what is being, uh, what is happening here, what is at stake, is not something to do with bare life in this sense of being reduced to it, uh, but uh, uh, not only exploiting this surplus that life produces, but also using it in a perverse way to uh, protect us, to shield us 
from the catastrophic real that is being created, why it is being put to use. So there is a kind of a redoubling, not only, uh, yeah, there is this surplus that we are meant to pr be producing all the time, but also uh, enjoying uh, um, the fact that uh, this kind of uh, thinking, that this kind of surplus protects us somehow magically from uh, the real that is about to. <laughs> New. Um, I think, yeah, I mean new. This is, uh, uh, I think it, what is new perhaps is that it has become such a kind of a massive way or um, a general way or general uh, of um, our functioning of social priorities and so on. So it's not that uh, it never happened before that this structure appeared, but some, somehow I think it is new in the way uh, of the social uh, presence that it has. But uh, it, yeah. Thank you so much for a very rich talk. I'm curious to hear you on um, a bordering phenomenon, namely the weakness of the will. So one could say in a philosophical tradition that would describe the weakness of the will as knowing but acting otherwise, mm -hmm. the problem could be described yeah, that yeah. there are situative reasons mm -hmm. now uh, that um, make me act against reasons that are yeah, operating yeah, on yeah, a general yeah. level. Mm -hmm. So, for example, jumping off of the train to catastrophe might entail, you know, situative discomfort. That's why why I'm not doing it. So I'm just, um, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. curious to hear you about yeah, yeah. Uh, the relation of disavowal and weakness of the will mm -hmm. of that structure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for for the question. Yeah, I guess this is. I mean, obviously, I come here from a kind of a theoretical perspective that, uh, for me articulates very strongly or convincingly what is at stake in this kind of uh, phenomena. And this is the, the kind of psychoanalytic Freudian, Lacanian uh, take on it, which, uh, in which the, uh, the weakness of the will does not appear as a concept. Uh, there can be lack of desire, there can be, uh, it, it is not, but this of course doesn't, that does not mean uh, particularly in these cases where we are kind of confronted with certain phenomena which um, uh, are kind of uh, obviously such and such. It's not that there is much doubt about this or that then there is this uncertainty and then we can calculate, okay. Uh, very often it's really quite obvious, it's, there is no big mystery about it and still uh, not only we go on, because uh, I think there is also perhaps a difference between what I described here as this f uh, form or structure of fetish is disavowable and simply what perhaps could be the, um, you meant when you said you are at the same time you are simply scared to jump off that train because okay it's uh, so this is why I said it would be an act of courage not that so obviously there is this but I think this is not such a problem it's not such a problem that people are scared it's <laughs> kind of normal even but there is some more perfidious structure. Uh, at work here, uh, which is we are not even seriously thinking about jumping off or not. It's not even that uh, we say, okay, uh, it's scary. Uh, it, it's simply that it kind of um, takes this possibility um, um, off the table before it even appears because there is this kind of other mechanism that uh, uh, that uh, dives in and which I think um, it's not, sim so th this is why I think that uh, th the weakness of the will um, is a, perhaps a softer or more psychological problem perhaps than this kind of a more structural problem that I was trying to, to, to describe uh, with this. 
Alenka, just you used the phrase "objective decession," a uh, deception, deception yeah. uh, in your earlier exposition. <laughs> so that was, is that what this is? Is this objective dece um, deception? Just no, I use the the term, and there is something I'm not sure if he uses the the the, 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 the same uh, term, but it's something that how Manuni describes uh, the difference between you know when uh, it's just the argument related to the. Uh, to the question of whether it is simply children who are being naive and credulous and so they believe in these crazy fairy tales, uh, whereas on the other hand, the adults know better and so they, they, they have this enlightened knowledge and they know how things stand. And uh, I, I think he convincingly also shows how um, this is, we could not say that they believe some stupid stories because uh, that they are being objectively deceived in the sense of all the social effort goes into the fact that there is no, the, the, uh, it's not a belief, I mean, and they are, the, 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 the so-called katsinas are physically there, I mean, it's not, it's a, a, a reality that they see. So then they learn that this reality is other than they thought it was, but instead of simply saying, okay, there were no katsinas, as I guess also happens many times, uh, not, not everybody forms this kind of belief, but uh, it is strongly encouraged in, also in this kind of social context, which is not exactly the same as ours, but again, it's strongly encouraged socially that this shift happens. Not that they will simply uh, um, kind of survive this blow, perhaps repress some things, uh, because we could also be deceived, we could say, okay, uh, others are deceptive from time to time, so they are not perfect, but okay, nevertheless, uh, there is a, a certain trust in social authority that can remain, and perhaps that can even only be inaugurated at this point as a leap of trust. Okay, I know that there is, there are perfect, but I expect from the authorities to behave like this. It's a, it's a kind of a leap again, which could go in this direction without necessar necessarily forming this disavowed belief. No, they are there. They are intact. They are there. They are perfect. Uh, although I know that they are not the ones who are dancing um, right in, in front of me. So uh, by objective deception, I simply meant this kind of, a, if the reality, um, as you can rationally appreciate it also rationally, uh, is presented to you in such way, then you cannot say that you have some magic belief in something. It's simply uh, the only way you can relate to this reality. It is knowledge, it's the, they don't, you don't know any better because you have no objective reasons to think. So, it, it, so it's not in this more looking sort of objective deception in the sense that uh, you are obviously also deceived by the institutions that are objectively supporting the, uh, the, the illusion and to which you then get uh, initiated and so on. Uh, but here it was more meant as this kind of uh, uh, argument that the, the, this kind of linear uh, story or trajectory of first it's naive belief and then it's knowledge and then regression to belief is false because it is the knowledge that can produce, that produces the, in the traumatic side of knowledge that produces the, uh, the belief that was supposedly there naively before he, he, they started. Yeah. Right there. yeah, thank you so much. Um, so my question is to in, ask you to, to help me think a little bit about the shift from the individual subject to the collective. So mm -hmm. in your use of the we, I have this sense of many individuals engaged in this disavowal collectively creating a problem. Mm -hmm. But there also seems to be with climate change a real issue with collective subjectivity such that I might jump off the train and be, you know, um, uncomfortable and the train may still kill me, mm -hmm. you know, because we have to conceptual and indeed thinking that, you know, I go through this disavowal and act individually may do nothing. And so I, I'm wondering what's the, what is the role here of distrust in collective action? Or what is the role of the collective subject in, in the analysis? Or how do we get there? Uh, thank you very, very much for this question. I think it's a crucial question uh, to ask uh, because this is perhaps one of the blanks or missing points uh, in, in this paper. Um, 
you are very right first to point out how uh, there is this we on the one side that I used in terms, in terms of precisely there are many of us, just uh, there is this mass of people, many individuals, like uh, thousands, hundreds, whatever, doesn't really matter, uh, that can be in quite individually engaged in these uh, practices of disavowal, although they are in a way socially encouraged, but they, they are also encouraged as our, I mean, even though they are socially encouraged, they do relate or do they kind of a, uh, address a certain psychological, let's say, uh, individual uh, dimension. So there is no collective here. Uh, there is no, I, I don't think there is any real collective of this bubble. You have, you can have groups, you can have like from conspiracy theories that I mentioned to many other things. So we are collective, we can, but I think the term collectively is perhaps not used rightly there. We are collectively behaving in, in a certain way. I, I don't think this is what collective means in the, 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 the sense also that I guess you use it. So we are um, massively engaging in, uh, uh, in this kind of practices. But on the other hand, but precisely there is no collective that uh, comes out of this. And uh, I think the crucial point that you also uh, kind of uh, yeah, pointed out is precisely that in order for us to jump from this train, we would need to act as a collective. Even if every one of us jumped off, it wouldn't be uh, the, 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 this wouldn't be the, in, the, the action part of this jumping off is precisely also thinking differently about who we are. It's not simply committing some strange uh, suicidal gesture. It's precisely rethinking uh, who we are, where we are going in first of all, and I will be talking a little bit about this tomorrow at Land Seminar, um, uh, uh, creating this we that is about to jump off, die or not. Because uh, uh, it is simply not, it's not uh, there yet, the we, that so it's and I think that precisely this move, uh, and I'm really grateful for this remark, uh, from staying on the train and jumping off it, involves this crucial moment of the constitution of a collective subject that alone is capable of jumping off the train, uh, because uh, everything else we we can also be uh, encouraged to jump off in some kind of a uh, similarly. Um, kind of uh, uh, self-destructive uh, gestures that I, I, I mentioned, and this doesn't necessarily amount to anything. But what is, so in a way, we could formulate it perhaps like this, what is really repressed in this massive disavowal, which is not itself about repression, but what is repressed in this <coughs> massive disavowal is precisely the possibility of a collective subject, the possibility of something emerging there, some knowledge emerging there, which would then kind of, yeah, I, I, I think we could even work this, uh, use this work, uh, mi miraculously pr uh, produce not, not only, not simply a solution, but uh, open up possibilities that are simply beyond our horizon now, because we are really enclosed in these alternatives. You, you jump off or not, but precisely uh, if the we that could jump off emerged, then we would know perhaps a little bit where to jump and where we are jumping <laughs> to, to go on with this metaphor. But it's a crucial uh, point to make uh, that uh, uh, the emergence of a collective subject is part of this um, it, it's also part of the risk that we are obviously not willing to take, and this is uh, what is strange, you know. It's uh, as if we were, um, uh, I mean, the, there is this kind of a, uh, oh, okay, I won't go there, I will talk about this tomorrow, but there is uh, uh, this mechanism that I described as we would rather die then, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is kind of very nicely encaptured in, um, this is a paper by Maurice Blanchot, which is called uh, The Apocalypse is Disappointing. And he simply, I mean, it, uh, he talks about something that is becoming very relevant again. Uh, namely, this goes back to the peak of the Cold War, the nuclear uh, powers competing, and the fact that should we 
have new, uh, the question is basically something asked by Jaspers. Uh, should we have nuclear weapons even if this can destroy us all? Uh, is this so? So there is this kind of question universality of all the other things, but I, I won't, uh, I don't have time to go into details now, but uh, there is a way in which I think one can um, read Blanchot, his argument, uh, there is something like this. Okay, when we say we can all die, we will all disappear. Uh, this is actually the first time that a we emerges in this kind of a, uh, in a general way. It, but it only emerges as in, in this negative way. It's, I mean, it's a kind of Hegelian paper in the uh, vocabulary. It's an abstract negativity. Uh, we can all die, and only this possibility of us all disappearing make it possible, makes it possible for us to say we, because it's a kind of a false, um, uh, full, uh, it's a mass of people, but if you can say all of us will die, you have the impression that there is a totality. Huh? It's, but he says, but wait a minute, this is a, a false abstract totality. But the problem is that the we, the real we, that is about to die, to disappear in this possible disaster, doesn't yet exist as such. It only exists precisely as the mass of individuals uh, leading their separate whatever lives and projects. The we, in this more emphatic sense, the we that will disappear, does not exist as such. And then, this is how I read it, it's a little bit, uh, but he says, okay, so, but we are actually re ready to risk this, to risk the nu nuclear weapons and everything, because we are afraid of what are totalitarian threat, the, the communism and so on. Um, we are ready to die, uh, but we are, so to risk this, but we are at the same time afraid of risking precisely the alternative of first building the we through what he calls communism there, the be, the we, the true we that is about to disappear. So why this kind of, uh, I mean, okay, I, I went too quickly there, but there is a certain dialectics of courage and um, fear that is uh, at pl in place here where we are really willing to, to be heroic and to, to, to sacrifice our lives for this or that, but somehow strangely, um, we are afraid of trying something that might have saved us, actually, is it, uh, if it happened in this way. So it's, uh, uh, it's interesting. So it's, uh, and the question of the we, of the collective subject, is at the very uh, center of it, and what does it mean um, to, be, to talk about a collective subject in the sense of what Hegel would call a concrete universal and not simply in this kind of abstraction, uh, drawing a line around uh, every dot that, he, uh, that is there, but a kind of meaningful we that would, in fact, would, could count as the subject of whatever certain history, politics, or whatever. Yeah, sorry, this was uh, a bit long. Excuse me. Thank you. Hi. Oh, that's really loud. Sorry. Um, isn't the sort of fundamental reason why people, or the we, however you want to call it, aren't jumping off the train, uh, the fact that it's borderline impossible to do inference on what will happen if you were to jump off the train, whether the other actors will also jump off the train, mm -hmm. and also the immense uncertainty around where the train is going in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like if you take it as a fact that we will die and if we all jumped, we won't, then the calculus is very clear, but isn't the fundamental reason for inaction the fact that that calculus is immensely complex in the first place? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, uh, this is perhaps uh, another part of the question which I haven't touched in, in, in this discussion because I was more uh, preoccupied precisely by the question of what are the mechanisms that prevent uh, this, uh, what I wouldn't so much call a complex calculus, but I will go into this, uh, but, but what prevents us to, to make a move there? Uh, and I think uh, 
I don't know, you, you've probably all seen uh, Don't Look Up, the movie. I mean, I'm one of those who really liked it. And I think simply that the craziness of the situation is depicted really uh, nicely, not simply, I mean, the, 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 the farce of it, the comedy of it is much more real then the, I mean, there were such, there were approaches saying, okay, if the movie were more serious, less whatever, sarcastic. No, I, I, I really claim that the reality is much more, even more comical. It's difficult to be so sarcastic and comical as is the reality that we live in. And that this is very well comes across in, in the movie. So I think the, the, your question actually relates for me directly to the previous question. Uh, which again, and this is, yeah, uh, I don't have a, a direct answer how to form a collective that will, because the collective would be the complex calculus behind this. The formation, I mean, the, the complex calculus, it would be the way of perhaps um, precisely avoiding the calculation in the sense of will it be worth or not, because we would have some other uh, thing in mind uh, or, 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 or some other plan that, that simply survive. And here we are back in this, I mean, it's, uh, it's also that perhaps sometimes it's, um, how to put it, um, the fear, uh, I mean, okay, we don't know where the, the train goes. I think to some extent we know, so for to some uh, uh, cases at least. Uh, then, uh, if we have the, uh, if we reduce this to the question of how can I um, calculate what the others will do and so on, uh, then obviously we are in a very in a kind of a different situation, which also I think uh, Lacan plays with and describes in this famous uh, prisoners uh, whatever uh, story. But this is another. Question: I, I think w w what happens there is precisely that there could be moments, and I have, I think historically this happened, uh, that on this kind of a train, the passengers just kind of uh, collectively decided to, to jump up. I mean, it's not. Um, it, this is not a situation that can be played out rationally through going through all the calculations. Uh, it is a certain against leap, again leap of faith or leap of uh, a decision to make, but which is sometimes made on the uh, on the ground of the decision that what is going on is becoming unbearable, and for some people and for many people it certainly is. So it's also one can get a push uh, from from this side. So. Uh, but then, yeah, the, the, it is the question of the forming of the collective that is at the core of the, also of this question. And I, I don't think it's simply any kind of a supercomputer that could do all the calculations would be able to, because this is precisely what the act is all about. And subjectivity that is formed is precisely also formed through this bridging or making this leap of uh, this decision to do something else together, collectively. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, very illuminating. Um, I couldn't help but be reminded um, of a similar concept um, that you surely know, um, namely the idea of belief without owners that mm -hmm. Robert Faller and Slavoj mm -hmm. Žižek use, uh, the interpassivity. Yeah. And I was wondering if your argument could be summed up as somewhat similar in the sense of a knowledge without knowers. Um, mm -hmm. And then the question be, okay, what what's kind of the, the fine difference between, between believing, uh, like these beliefs that are out there without owners and knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I took your argument as one of, if there's a constitutive relation between knowledge and belief. Mm -hmm. um, but at, at the same time, I was thinking, okay, if knowledge without knowers, knowledge that is out there, objectified, nobody really believes it, isn't that what we call institutional knowledge mm -hmm. or what Hegel would call objective spirit in the mm -hmm. sense that, um, 
that is something I guess we argue for in, in a way that, that this knowledge is institutionalized to tackle mm-hmm. these problems. But at the same time, it comes with the downfall of that you externalize and objectify it and maybe even fetishized and therefore um, have other dreadfalls and deadlocks. Um, w- does this speak, yeah. speak to no, you? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I think, yeah, there are, ver- there are several questions here, or several uh, ways to answer these questions or several directions to go. First of all, yeah, I think this is a very interesting idea that uh, to parallel this um, beliefs without owners, with uh, yeah, knowledge without n- people knowing them. There is a similar structure. And I think perhaps the whole um, uh, chain of questions that you have risen arises precisely from the fact that you, there is this, um, there are already in Manuni's paper and then what uh, Fowler takes out of it, uh, there are many, many things at play. So belief, the, the question of the belief, also of the illusion, of the theatrical illusion that Fowler talks about a lot, is one which is a, a one field and it's a very general field of this kind of how beliefs actually are we only believe through others how there is no, uh, the, the, no original believer that it's always uh, like this. And so to some extent you can say, yeah, there is something similar going on when knowledge is at stake. But at the same time, uh, I think here that there is a difference between at least this portion of uh, uh, whatever it is, the dynamics that I wanted to, uh, to sketch uh, out here is that, uh, first of all, uh, um, there is this question of the fetish, which I, the more I think about it, the more I think it's important, and this redoubling of not only that there is this disavowal, but there is the, the enjoyment of the disavowal itself, which kind of uh, functions here in a more specific way, I would say that simply with uh, uh, these beliefs that are always anonymous and so on. Because here, actually, if you just make a kind of observation, it is very important, contrary to belief, uh, beliefs without owners, that I say, I know it. You know, it's, it, it's a very different structure. You would say, I believe it. You'd say, no, I don't believe it. Others believe it, and I'm not so stupid. So it's almost like the, the, the mirror image of it. So here, it's kind of, I precipitate and say, I know it, I know it, it's not people know. I mean, you can say, okay, it's well known, but it, the, it, it means that uh, it's important that you uh, um, emphasize your subjective knowledge about, uh, about it. So, uh, and I think so there is this uh, difference, and then there is the question of uh, the institutions precisely, which I think are not so much incarnating this belief are kind of in the, um, as they are falling apart, the institutions, I think it's one of the things that we can uh, take as a diagnosis or something like this, of this is that most of the institutions are kind of falling apart and individual enjoyment, which is where I try to situate the, the disavowed belief. So, I mean, the, the very, uh, it's not so much the institutions, but if I can somehow enjoy it, I mean, and this, by this I don't mean like hedonistically indulge in it, but that, that there is a kind of a surplus enjoyment that I can get out of this, then uh, I can believe that this still functions as it should. And I think that the uh, falling apart, generally speaking, of uh, social institutions in sense of some kind of a commons, uh, and this kind of a... Um, Per, um, um, proliferation of uh, uh, the perverse form of enjoyment, and by perverse I don't mean any kind of uh, debauchery, or just, just this kind of really tiny reflexive turn on enjoy, of enjoyment on itself, it's, uh, it, it's slightly different. So, uh, yeah, uh, but um, the, the, the knowledge, it's it, it kind of uh, functions, I mean, in, in the way that we we kind of protect ourselves from the very knowledge that this knowledge, <laughs> from the very real or what the very content of the knowledge, but by knowing it, I think it's an, I don't know, it just struck me as some uh, interesting thing which 
could be approached in terms precisely of the uh, object uh, fetish and not so much in this kind of uh, interpersivity. Yeah, it's a, it's a slightly different, it goes in a little bit different of direction, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, my question is going in a similar direction, um, although I hope with a slightly different twist. Um, and it's just a naive methodological question. Why did you turn to Descartes um, and not mm. to um, the incent incentives and forms of thinking that you um, frequently pointed to, that is conspiracy theories or other contemporary phenomena? Why did you turn to Descartes rather than these recent phenomena to outline the relationship between um, uh, certainty and what one holds as knowledge? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, simply because uh, when I was uh, starting out, starting to think about this question of uh, how um, the disavowed belief uh, is kind of a direct result of a certain knowledge of deception, uh, I thought of this major figure in, in, the, in the, at the very basis of, as I said, modern science and philosophy, which is that there is the big deceiver uh, there, uh, we, and the, the, this kind of coincidence um, is something kind of uh, uh, obvious and ominous, and, uh, but I used it precisely. This is why I did not simply follow the card there. I just simply used it as a way to kind of uh, point out or outline uh, four different structures. Some of them, I didn't have time to go into this, but as, as you remember, one of them was precisely something that you can associate with uh, whatever, conspiracy theories. Uh, some would be, the, the, this perverse structure is yet another thing. So it's not that I wanted, I mean, I just thought that this moment uh, that happens there uh, is a kind of, uh, perhaps, yeah, the, the very inaugurating point of what we call modernity, which we haven't uh, left since I, uh, yet. I, I think it is a kind of uh, brain point of modernity and how uh, what we are living today also can be um, put on the map as one of the ways in which this is being articulated in a new way. So I'm not saying that this is this is not in Descartes. I mean, that perhaps I was, uh, because the Descartes just uses this hypothesis uh, in order to come to certainty and then introduce the good, non-deceiving other. But what we are dealing with today, with also conspiracy theories and some other, is precisely, it's a, another strange move when you move, uh, when you kind of remain with this hypothesis and you turn it itself into a form of certainty, saying, okay, uh, the other is definitely uh, deceiving me all the time. I only need to prove that in order to, by consequence, prove that I am, as the object of the deception, also am and exist. So it's not the card here. It's something, but I think that, so I only simply use this, as I called it, short circuit that was kind of brought massively to, not simply to our attention, but invented by Descartes as a starting point to map out then um, things that are also could be related to, uh, 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 and the, then also the anxiety in these other stories. So uh, it's not, this was not all about Descartes. I just uh, thought it was interesting to um, remember that it's there that it happened, this short circuit, yeah. I okay. Well, we well, yeah, we had our two-hour seminar, and please uh, <laughs> give it up for uh, Olympus Repentance. <laughs> Thank you. <sir. laughs>